the idea of new economic theory or a, a development of economic theory itself sounds extremely ambitious. The whole world is aware now of the uh, more or less of the insufficiencies of present theory and uh, there are so many ideas out there and so many diverse approaches that are pushing for greater recognition. The position we've taken at the Academy is that we're not just looking for short-term answers to what do we do about the financial crisis or about global trade today. We're really looking at what Evo called the new paradigm, a fundamental shift. What is going to be the future of social science down the line? And how will not only economics but other social sciences evolve uh, in the future? And can we look at and explore some of the parameters and characteristics of an evolutionary development of social science, particularly economics, even if uh, we know that we're taking up a, an extremely challenging task? This is, as Ivo mentioned, one of, we've had almost 20 conferences uh, or more than 20 conferences focusing on different dimensions of it. What I'd like to do this morning is give you a very brief uh, overview of what I think are the most essential conclusions we have drawn, and they will be very general because of the time constraints. But when we talk about the future of economic theory, uh, I'd like us to have in mind the very broadest uh, scope. We have to think of a theory that's going to help us understand even better than up until now the rise of the West over the last 500 years. The increase in world GDP, per capita GDP 12-fold over the last 200 years. The growth of Korea from a country with per capita income at the level of India to where it is uh, today uh, in the OECD over uh, half a century. What's happened in China? Uh, India's Green Revolution, where in five years a country that was heavily dependent on food aid simply to feed its people became food self-sufficient and then a, a major food exporter. Uh, we have to keep in mind situations like 1933 in the US when during the banking crisis when FDR became president after three failed years of managing what became the most serious financial crisis in American history. Uh, and then he got on the radio and told the American people, all that I learned at Harvard in economics did not prepare me for this job or this situation. Nothing we've tried over the last three years has succeeded. The real thing we have to fear is fear itself. I want you to go back and put your money in the bank and let's get on with building this nation. These are not the kind of things we normally think about when we talk about economic theory or how economies work. But, so we need to keep in mind a wide diversity of issues in the past. And of course in the present, in the future. We're living just at the end of uh, and still with the memories of the 2008 financial crisis. We're seeing this dramatic retreat, at least verbally, from globalization. Uh, from the leaders of globalization, from the UK and the USA, uh, we're seeing the, the, the challenges that Europe is facing. Uh, we're talking about uh, dire predictions about the future of employment in the world, increasing concern, especially since Piketty's book, about rising levels of inequality. Uh, all of these issues are part of the subject matter and of course this overriding concern which we all become much more aware of, the challenges to the very sustainability of human civilization on this planet. So many people have worked on different dimensions of this and all of those are valid dimensions. What we'll be looking for is can we frame a, a foundations that will be able to accommodate and reflect more validly on all of these issues and help us in the future to grapple with them more effectively. So people coming to this meeting as well as our other meetings come from different perspectives, from different priorities, whether it's ecology or finance or uh, trade or human welfare or employment or 
uh, social stability, whatever it is, all are valid. So, uh, in a brief overview, uh, I want to start with a simple premise, and that is that regardless of the system we have, we are not maximizing the utilization of our human opportunities and potentials today. We have resources that are not being effectively used. We have needs that are not being effectively met. And there, regardless of what our theoretical framework is, there must be a way we can do this better. There must be a way we can utilize the $250 trillion in global financial assets, the hundreds of millions of people who are unemployed and over a billion who are underemployed, uh, the technologies we have, the organizational capacities. And ultimately what we're looking for is not a perfect theoretical construct. We're looking at uh, a concepts that will help us practically, effectively do better than we're doing today. In doing that, if you look at the history of economy, there are so many factors that are critical to, the, to economic development. And I've just listed in a, a big scope uh, the, some of the core issues that have contributed to the progress of humanity from the time of generating agricultural surpluses to the creation of markets and trade to the consolidation of larger political units that could help organize economy on a larger scale, to the role of law and governance, transport and communication, which opened up the age of the mercantile age where Europe went all over the world in creating global markets, the rise of banking and finance, and so forth through here. I think, I hope you'll all see uh, core issues. All of these have been the, the topics of study and discussion at previous conferences, uh, and all the way down to the role of the individual and the role of the way we think about knowledge and the way we think about uh, society and our social science. And ultimately, we are trying to keep all of this in mind in building a set of conclusions. And I'm going to share ten of those uh, very basic general conclusions with you. Uh, one is to remind us that what we call economy is a social institution and it's based on human relationships. And the prosperity we've generated is by learning and evolving a more effective technology, organizational technology, for human beings to relate to each other in productive, constructive, mutually beneficial ways. The purpose of these institutions ultimately is to serve the goals of the society. And the value of any institutions we have have to be evaluated in terms of how well are they meeting that functional purpose of really serving the broader interests of society. We are, in our efforts, trying to make explicit, there are implicit assumptions and values involved in uh, all social theory. Our argument is that we need, whatever our values are that we want to, that we're going to build on, we need to make those explicit so they can be seen, they can be challenged, they can be debated. And the explicit values that have come out of all our discussions is, that the social purpose of economy is to help us maximize human security, welfare, and well-being for everyone. Uh, and that that can only be achieved in conditions of peace and social stability, sustainability, uh, a, a recognition of human rights and dignity, and the fullest realization of human potential individually, socially, and humanity as a whole. This is our premise. It's not a scientific thesis. It is the value on which we're trying to build a more effective theoretical framework. We talk about economy, but our, base, our understanding of economy has to be based on a conception of society. And what we've been arguing for over and over is society is not a mere mechanism 
It's not a mere, it's not a computerized network of, of connections. It's a living organism. It's a complex, conscious living organism. It's got a, a conscious awareness. It's got an emotional content to it. It's got uh, uh, activities, relationships, values to it. And we need to be able to understand economy as a living thing, as a living expression of uh, the, social, uh, the social collective. And that that society is not merely local or national. And as we all know, most of economic thought developed and is framed around the national level. But increasingly, we live in a global society. And the society is global. And therefore, our understanding of economy has to have that global reach as well. Uh, and for me, the best analogy for this more organic, integrated conception of society is to our own human body. In medical science today, we know very well that it's impossible to separate physical illness from a, the emotional state and the mental state and the conscious expectations and aspirations of individuals. That when we say that the, uh, the society is conscious, we mean that our thoughts matter, our aspirations matter, our values matter, our emotions matter, our trust and faith matter, not just physically what we do or how much money we have or what technology. So that's what we mean by uh, something that's complex and living. Uh, a very important theme that's come back in all of our meetings, and it's come from virtually everyone who's participated, is we're not trying to develop a social science that is devoid or separate from human beings, uh, as if we're discovering the universal laws of nature. The society we have is what human beings are creating for their own purpose to realize their own values. And uh, it has to be value-based. Uh, the decisions we made have to be value-based. Nature didn't create global economy or international financial systems. We have created them. And we have to evaluate them and on how effectively they're meeting our needs. And as I said, those values need to be as explicit as possible. Obviously, I think we're all aware that uh, economy is over time, it grew more and more. All of the social sciences grew more and more compartmentalized. And now there's a recognition that we need to reconnect economy with ecology, or reconnect economy uh, with human rights, or reconnect economy uh, uh, with, po with po political uh, systems and law and so forth. And what we're looking for is a recognition, a, a, a conception of economics that really sees it as one part of a much more integrated conception of society as a whole, where it has linkages to all the other fields, social, psychological, cultural, ecological, and so forth. And we're conscious of those linkages. And we're not just focusing on that which is isolated from them. Because most of our problems today come at the points where economic theory has forgotten its relationship to other aspects of the society. Not only we're looking at interdisciplinarity, but we're looking at something transdisciplinary. And this word is being used more and more frequently, but in different senses. By transdisciplinary, what we mean is that all human activity, whether it's in economics or social or political or creative or educational fields or personal fields, all of it involves fundamental human processes, human processes of people trying to accomplish goals, realize their values, releasing their energy, directing their attention, organizing their activities. And we feel that an effective social science of the future has to arrive at some fundamentals of what are the social processes on which our economic, political, and other activity, cultural activities are based. Uh, in the physical sciences, we know all of physical phenomena have a fundamental basis defined in physics and in chemistry. Whereas in the social sciences, virtually each social science is building its own foundations as if it's uh, in a different universe. We don't have those shared conceptions of what the social process is. How do human beings accomplish? How do they realize? How do they fulfill their goals? And uh, so we're looking at trying to understand the process at that fundamental level, because essentially we want to improve 
the overall effectiveness of human beings in achieving uh, uh, and realizing our aspirations. One of the things that's often been lost sight of is that any social system or any political system or any economic system or ecological system for that matter expresses not only the way we function but expresses the way power is distributed in society. And too often this has been left behind uh, implicit and we don't realize that the economic system we have, as well as the political system, is an expression of power structures, of the distribution and sharing and the degree of democratization of power. And this is one of the things we feel has to be made explicit. We have to ask ourselves, what, who is the economy working for? Who benefits from it? And what are the mechanism or factors that determine how the benefits of, uh, of, uh, of power are uh, uh, are distributed and uh, enjoyed in the society. And this is not just a question of how we're going to distribute the pie, uh, how we're going to break it up, but uh, in very interesting discussions we had at one of our best conferences here in this room four months ago, we also looked at the formula of what is it that will maximize the overall power of the society? Is it by narrow restriction of the distribution of power? Or is it by wider and wider distribution of that power? And I think the historical evidence clearly supported the thesis that the wider and more equitable the distribution of power, the greater the overall power of the society for producing and realizing results. So this needs to be explicit. Thank you.